thanks so much for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to sort of reflect on the last few years and to talk a little bit about how my thinking has evolved um, going into this pandemic and then going through it and then uh, dealing with the current state. Um, so the title of my talk is The Once and Future Pandemic Impact on Healthcare. And I'm gonna describe what I mean by this title here as we go through this. Um, first thing is my disclosures. I do uh, some consulting. Uh, all of my financial relationships have no impact on anything I'm talking about um, and have been mitigated. So CME, I've been blessed. Um, first, um, thank you to everybody in this room, everybody in this call. Um, I am so incredibly grateful for my partnership uh, and your expertise in laboratory medicine uh, for a lot of things. Um, we can certainly talk about the role in COVID and we will a little bit about that. Um, the innovation, the accessibility, the partnership, the incredible amount of work uh, that you have done uh, is, you know, incredible. Um, so I'm really grateful. I'm currently super grateful, particularly around respiratory uh, virus surveillance. Uh, obviously, the work with our clinical microbiologists, as Josh mentioned, the incredible story of the COVID testing, which I think deserves, like, you know, a book written about the work that was done uh, at that point, you know, how that sort of the um, monkeypox virus testing was built upon that and how we were able to make that accessible to our community and so much more. So I'll start this off with just saying thank you. I appreciate uh, everything you guys do. You're incredible people, incredible team, incredible department. The other thing is sort of as a prologue, I want everyone to be very clear about is that um, this has been a shared experience. This is very different for me to talk about this experience in COVID because we all experience this. I'm not coming up here as an expert in the COVID pandemic because you know, I experienced it one way, you, everyone in this room experienced it, maybe in a similar or maybe a very different way. And I'm only gonna be talking about my experience and my perspective. It does not disclose, you know, disclude anyone else's perspective or experience, right? Um, so I just want people to understand the lens with which I'm approaching this talk. Okay, so before the pandemic happened, so as Josh mentioned, I'm an infectious disease doctor. My role at Harborview, I'm one of the associate medical directors. My primary responsibility is infection prevention controls, the prevention of infections in people who are in the hospital, in the clinic, uh, prevention of infections in hospital workers, so all healthcare workers. I'm the medical director for the employee health team there as well. And, uh, and I've worked kind of across UW Medicine, across our county, working with close relationships with public health to Alkin County for many years, as well as the Department of Health and across the country on these similar issues. Um, and so over the years, really, you know, obviously my primary focus is on how do we prevent these infections, but behind that is really thinking about as we've responded to various different types of outbreaks and epidemics and pandemics, ranging from influenza to measles to tuberculosis to what have you, how do we maintain the integrity of a healthcare system? How do we maintain the doors and open the, the accessibility to our community? Uh, for those of you uh, who are less familiar with Harborview down here in the bottom right, um, you know, it's a county-owned hospital. We have a mission statement that's quite long. And part of that mission is we never close, right? We keep the doors open all the time. It's the only level one burn and trauma center for the Pacific Northwest. We cannot close. And so when I think about the sort of challenges to uh, a facility, we often think about things like um, critical infrastructures, thinking about, you know, earthquakes and, you know, other natural disasters or mass shooting incidents. And those things are all super important to prepare for. But we need to think about healthcare facilities for other things, including uh, things like pandemics and the challenges to those facilities um, in a way that we think about, you know, dams after an earthquake or electrical production facilities. How we are able to provide healthcare is like access to electricity and water. And I think when we think about it that way, we start thinking about why we had many of the challenges we saw in, in hospitals and clinics uh, in across the globe, but you know here in Seattle as well, and informed a lot of the ways that I approached our response to the pandemic. Because my ultimate goal was how do we keep the doors open so they can do the work that we have to do. So if we think about that, we have to think of you know one way to think about this as well is this idea of resilience. How can we make a system, a facility, the physical space resilient? Now I'm gonna as I go through this, I'm gonna highlight some of the things that I got wrong as well, some of the things I missed. Uh, that fortunately some other people were able to pick up on, but I, I want to highlight. Um, I thought a lot about resilience, you know, over the last 10 years, thinking about how my hospital, Harborview, but any hospital responds to significant challenges, mostly in the infectious diseases world. Um, but I sort of underplayed or didn't fully understand how the resilience of the healthcare workers, the people 
in that space uh, was going to be manifest as well. So like, how do we balance facility and access with people who are experiencing something that's incredibly difficult um, in trying uh, and impacting not only their work in, at work, but their lives at home. And I sort of didn't catch that at the very beginning. Fortunately, we had other great people on our team, uh, Trish Critic, uh, most importantly, Ann Browning, uh, who works on the, both of whom work on the town hall with me, um, who really recognized and highlighted that and brought it to the front. But for a little bit of time there, I think that we had a gap. And that's one area we missed. Um, but this idea of resilience, like how do we make facilities more robust and able to flex and bend to sort of different types of assaults was really front of mind as we moved into this. So when we think about hospitals, you know, again, I'm focusing on Harborview because that's where I spend most of my time, but it's true for UWMC, Northwest, Swedish, everywhere, right? I think when people think about hospitals, they think about patients. It's a place where there are people in the hospital, in clinics, right? Uh, but the issue is they're far more complicated, right? There's not just patients. There's the families who are there with them, maybe spending the night with them or spending the entire admission with them, stay, staying in the same room. There's visitors. Some of the patients are small people who need someone with them all the time. Uh, some of them have significant uh, cognitive issues and are at risk for falling out of bed, right? And would do so if there wasn't a family member there by their side all the time. We have lots of entries and exits, right? I was just talking about getting into this building. Thank goodness I, I could dig up my UW card because I couldn't get in this building, which is different than the last time I was at this campus several years ago. Um, and now, you know, we have all these different entrances that have different ways to get in, but we also do lots of different things. We have helicopters coming in. We have obviously, you know, laboratories, radiology, emergency departments. You know, we have offsite clinics. We have a community around us, and that's true for all healthcare facilities. We have research spaces, specialty clinics. We have pathology. Um, lots and lots of places and things and things that add to the complexity of the environment. So when we start thinking about how do we make this building, this system, resilient it's actually significantly challenging to think about how do we approach that in a, in a healthy way. And just to highlight that, for any of you who've been around for more than five or six years, um, the R&T building, the research and training building, which is that building over there, um, was closed. We lost a huge amount of research space. We lost a lot of teaching space because of a cesium leak, right? A radiation leak. This was my first non-infectious disease emergency, so I was the medical lead for that response as well. So it was, it's been a kind of a rough few years going from um, you know, sort of my regular job to that where we lost an entire building. Um, and think about how do we replace that, right? Super stressful for the people who work there. How do we, what do we do when we lose all of our teaching space? You know, a lot of challenges there. So that was the preface that kind of led into um, the COVID-19 response. Now, we've had some successes in the world when we think about how we respond to disasters, to terrible impacts on humanity. This is a, a, a graphic from the New York Times post not that long ago looking at the death rate from natural disasters and how we've improved that, right? This is through a lot of different things. This is through international response, local response, EMS, all improving, better buildings, right? Better ways to predict, forecast natural disasters and move people out of harm's way. And that's been very successful. You can see that huge trend downward from several when we started tracking this 1920s, decade by decade, we've gotten down to maybe two or three uh, 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 deaths per 100K, you can see down there, right? And I just highlighted sort of 10,000 as sort of a, a line there because that'll be relevant here in a minute. So in terms of just a rate, we've gotten that down quite a bit through, right, building resiliency, being prepared and moving people out of harm's way. The challenge though is when we look at what we did, what happened in the COVID-19 pandemic, we were lacking resiliency as a nation. I think in some ways as a healthcare system, we were lacking in resiliency. Um, and we, I'll go through some of the reasons why, I think, as we go through this. But this is the whole sort of pandemic and looking at deaths. This isn't, you know, testing and who's not getting tested, who's getting tested, false positive, false, you know, whatever. This is people who died. And this is the rate. You can see compared to that prior graph, you know, where we're looking at, you know, in 2010, maybe, uh, you know, five or 10 deaths per 100K. Weekly death rate per 100K over here, you know, and some of these peaks, six, seven, people dying per 100K, right? And you just look at the absolute numbers in terms of the weekly deaths. This was a massive, massively morbid, massively mortal uh, pandemic. And the impact on our country and uh, our healthcare systems, as well as our community was enormous. And this happened despite our ability, you know, to prevent all these other natural disasters. We didn't look at a pandemic like we looked at these natural disasters. And I think this is part of what informs that 
resilience perspective that we don't think about healthcare like we think about electricity or we think about dams or other similar infrastructure. And we didn't think about pandemics like we think about natural disasters. Our whole sort of framework around maintaining the status quo was really different context. Not infectious, natural disasters, and like hardware like electricity, water, and so forth. I mean, I think that set us up poorly. Um, so that's sort of the prologue. Why, why I'm gonna talk about the way I, I'm gonna talk about and also sort of informs the way I think about and have been thinking about this. So I'm gonna talk some of the details. So that's like the 30,000 foot view. I told Josh, 30,000 come down to the sort of ground and then back up again. Um, so chapter one, the, till March 2020. So at Harborview, our team has been built, waiting for uh, or, or developing a response to pandemic pathogens for a long time. Um, we are at Harborview, uh, the site that's on deck, for, should someone show up with, for instance, known or suspected cold, uh, Ebola or another pathogen of, of high concern. So in 20, you know, 2014, we did a number of rule outs there. I don't know if anyone was working in that facility. We had a biocontainment unit that we could throw up around patients, very effective. We built teams on this. And you can see, you know, we're doing this, all this gear. You can see on the far left is training down our emergency department. Uh, this is a group uh, of nurses and docs training to take care of a patient. Um, and uh, I'll just point out that person in the bottom left is Vanessa McCarowitz, who's my partner. She's my uh, nurse leader dyad in all this work. And she's really led all of that work and deserves all the credit. So we did a lot of this work, right? We did some of this with Ebola rule outs and so forth in 2014. Um, but uh, despite that, again, facing even challenges as we started dealing with the real deal. So as we kind of fast forward to December of 2019, kind of incredible to say that, um, we got these messages. And maybe for those of you who are in the infectious disease world or sort of seeing some of these things emerge, there's tweets and posts and social media and so forth talking about this issue of, of hospitals in Wuhan getting hit pretty hard. And when I point out from an infection prevention angle, I was seeing pictures like this with people dressed like this, but in these wards. Do you think anyone's washing their hands in those wards? No, right? Does everyone in there have a confirmed case of COVID-19? No. This picture is, is actually one of the most important things that sort of illustrates my, one of my greatest concerns around infectious diseases and what I do. We cannot set up systems that ha make hospitals turn into factories of transmission. That's what happened in Wuhan, despite their incredible ability to build facilities. That drives transmission. We see this with influenza. We've seen this with tuberculosis. We see it with HIV, right? Totally drug resistant TB, XDR TB. Major driver is healthcare associated transmission. People with HIV, advanced HIV coming into hospitals with poor infection prevention practices, sitting next to people with tuberculosis, who then can't clear it, get treated, and you know, develop drug resistance. Very clearly shown. Um, and so my greatest fear is that we would get to a stress point, right, with seeing too many people, that we would be actually perpetuating and adding to the pandemic. That was my greatest concern, thinking about that. In addition to, because then what do you do? You have to shut down. Then you don't have access. Right? And so again, think about that resilience. How do you make a system resilient? This got me very concerned. Um, and you can see, you know, I don't know to what extent this informs the current approach in China to COVID-19. It's not something I'm an expert on, but they had a, you know, a very difficult and terrible time in their early response. And that may inform the way they're responding to things now. Um, so I'm gonna fast forward. That's sort of December uh, 2019. Uh, January 22nd, 2020, 6 o'clock in the evening, case count 555 worldwide, including 16 healthcare workers, 17 deaths. And you can see the spread over uh, uh, Eastern Asia there. You see the map in the globe, and you see one case in the United States. Uh, as you all know, that was a case here in Washington State. Um, it was a patient who had uh, returned from China, spent time in King County, going to the grocery store, going to the restaurants, and then was diagnosed in uh, Snohomish County, hospitalized at, at Prov Everett. And you can see the governor, uh, Inslee, and then our then Secretary of Health, John Wiesman, and the CDC on the ground for that one person. Snohomish County man has the first known US case of new virus. Just thinking about that, this is what the, the response was to that one case we had on the ground. But what we quickly learned, because of our whole framing of our sort of response to natural disasters and, and thinking about uh, pandemics, we, we're not prepared. And I say we, 
public health was not prepared. They were not uh, scaled and resourced to do this work through no fault of their own. So they're incredibly strong advocates for better resourcing, but our country, because we have not looked at this in the same way we look at earthquake preparedness or forest fires or things like that, we have historically starved our public health colleagues. And so very quickly, it got to the point where that one person had gone to the restaurants and gone to grocery stores, had accrued a huge number of, of exposures, almost 750 exposures, right, in that very early days. With one person up there, they had a person pending at this point. So one person, 750, and public health was like, we can't do contact tr tracing for this number. This is like so far beyond their capabilities that they, within one person, one week, were out, they couldn't do it. They, were in, they, were, they didn't have the resources to do that work. Um, and so they needed help. And that's where, I, you know, I've been watching this, like probably others in this room or on the call, been watching this for weeks and weeks, thinking about it. Back in 2014, because we were trying to think about how do we take care of patients who have, with known or suspected Ebola, uh, particularly like flu season when that case was, people can have symptoms that could be something else. Uh, might not be Ebola, might not be, back then it was, uh, was NCOV, right? Um, can we keep them out of the hospital? Because putting them in the hospital puts health workers at risk, puts other people at risk. So we developed this protocol called the Home Assessment Team back in 2014. Uh, could we go to people's houses who had just you know, had an exposure or came from an endemic country or a country where the outbreak was happening in West Africa, go to their house, assess them, test them, and uh, keep them at home if they're safe, clinically stable. It didn't really work out well for lots of reasons for Ebola, but public health called us that weekend and said, hey, could you do this for these exposed people who may or may not have symptoms? And again, remember it's respiratory virus season, this is January. Um, a lot of people with sniffles and coughs and fevers who had been around this person. And so uh, I have to give huge credit to Tim Dellett and many other leaders in Utah Medicine because we that was Saturday morning, De Jeff Duchin called me, Saturday afternoon, thumbs up, and we were to start seeing people uh, on Monday evening of that week. And this is our home assessment team. There's Vanessa in the middle. That's Dr. Chloe Bryson Kahn off to the right. Uh, Roy Godwin, one of the most incredible nurses you'll ever meet uh, as a Harborview nurse. And this is what we did. We had these two vans that would go out and, and see people who had been exposed to develop symptoms that public health was tracking. People who were coming from uh, Wuhan, you know, had seen a f you know, friends and family and traveled back. And you know, the first person we saw was a little five-year-old girl uh, whose uh, family was from China and had come back from Wuhan who had the sniffles. And we went to her house over in Bellevue or something. And you know, in those full gowns and gloves, and they were like, you know, bending over and like sticking this thing in her nose. You know, it was, then we went to high rises, some Bellevue high rise. We went to people's ho hotels and people had returned back. Um, you know, a lot of these folks uh, were just all over the place, all over the county and going out and doing this work. And while we're doing this, we're kind of doing our regular job, right? There really wasn't much discussion at all uh, about this issue. The other thing that came out, and again, I don't need to talk to you guys about this, so I'm not gonna spend much time, is that our ability to test people was really challenging. They had to meet all these criteria, epidemiological criteria, clinical criteria, and then we get it off and it would take time. It was super painful. Um, I'm sure it was painful for much more painful for people in this room, but doing it uh, and going out to these sites and doing this testing and then having to wait and make sure, calling people to make sure it was done was really hard. And then you also know very clearly about the, what was I would argue is a debacle around how CDC had to make their own test and it didn't work, right? It just even though there are other places in the world that are doing this testing very well and accurately, the CDC test initially was terrible. And so even when we we're sending it out, it was like, that doesn't work. We have to get, go out and get new tests from people. It was very, very painful. Um, so that was all sort of happening in January, February. Um, there's like a patient coming off. We started getting people coming into the ED uh, with this. Uh, and so there's Roy again, you know, EMS was like getting off the rigs, like with nothing. They had like maybe a surgical mask on. I'm like, you guys need to time out. You need to put, gloves on, you need to put gowns on. Like we don't know how this thing actually moves about. Uh, you need to do some more work. And you can see Roy doing that work and getting people in the chairs and getting them out. This is me, uh, beginning of February, sort of, and it seems, it seems kind of silly to put up there, but um, there was a moment where we're around this table and we had other people from Utah Medicine talking about our response and realizing that no one was doing anything. Like there was no response. Like the government really wasn't doing anything. There wasn't like, you know, what, trying to think, I'm trying to think of the right metaphor, but there was no one coming to the rescue, right, and recognizing what was happening. And to some extent, even like our own system didn't understand how 
concerning what was happening was going to happen. That was me zipping up my jacket. My, my colleagues, my team knows when I pull that hood over my head, it's like, oh my God, you know, what's going to happen next? And unfortunately, uh, bad things happen. Bad things did happen. I don't think it's surprising, actually, in retrospect. These are two members of our team uh, uh, who are part of our home assessment team. Front page, Seattle Times, uh, March 2nd. Second U.S. coronavirus death in King County. More cases likely. I'll also point out low-income workers may be hit harder by coronavirus. Um, so this is, again, this is March, so we're kind of moving around a little bit of time here. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute because I think that was really impactful. So fast forward through March, going from sort of super stressed, really no awareness, to some awareness by the end of March, but really based on this awful event. People probably have, uh, remember this picture uh, from the Life Center Northwest um, nursing home disaster. This was a disaster within a disaster. Over the course, and I'll show you a timeline here in a minute, um, was an absolute human disaster and tragedy um, in the middle of a much larger disaster that we were unprepared for um, completely. I have to say that the team on the ground did incredible work. The nurses, the uh, nursing assistants in that center, you know, they, they didn't expect to see this at all in a million years. There was no known COVID, right, in our area. And they did the best they could. It was awful for the patients, awful for the families, awful for the people who worked there. The EMS folks did incredible work. We had ER doctors going out there, Steve Mitchell and others, going boots on the ground, down there trying to figure out how to get these people out. Evergreen Hospital was quickly overwhelmed as most of these patients who were sick went to their facility. Overwhelmed, our ICU just getting crushed with older adults with COVID uh, and acute care getting overwhelmed as well. Um, so that was sort of like the changing point. Um, and so that really brings us, that feels like, you know, it's only like two months-ish, two and a half months of, of that time, but it really was sort of the first chapter. So the second chapter is, I think, the one that everybody is aware of, and that's when the world changes. And that really brings us to this timeline. So I can tell you, we got to the end of February. Uh, Helen Chu and her team uh, decided to test someone who had a flu test, was negative, but had symptoms to see whether that person had COVID. Um, it was off protocol, but it was the right thing to do. Uh, and she detected the first community case of COVID-19 in the United States. It was in a high school uh, student. Um, we didn't know this, but there was a patient from that facility who had died at Harborview. That, that, so that was like 25 February and 26 February. It was like a Tuesday. A uh, handful of patients from a sniff were admitted, test positive for SARS towards the end of that week. Um, on that Saturday, our team was going out to test that high school student and his family. So he had gotten better, but his family needed to be cleared. So we went out to their house, pulled up in their driveway. I don't mean to laugh, but with our two big vans and the whole thing. And uh, the family freaked out, right? Because no one knew he had COVID. And there's these two vans with people looking like, what's that terrible outbreak movie, you know? Um, and they're like super stretched. He's like, can you get out of here? Can you go? Can you go? You know? Um, and we were hoping to get all done by Saturday morning, be done. And then we found out about what happened Friday. My good colleague, Frank Rito, an ID doctor at Evergreen, made all those diagnoses and figured out what was going on at skilled nursing facility. Uh, so we didn't go home. That night, we found out the Valley had a positive patient who had been there for a week with no personal, you know, no precautions, no nothing. And then during that evaluation, we realized that person who had died at Harborview in the ICU went to hospice after a respiratory disease, uh, no special precautions, was from Life Center. And post-mortem later on, we found out he had COVID, or had COVID at that time. So that was a Saturday. Sunday, uh, we figured this out. We figured this huge exposure to all the nurses, docs, and other uh, healthcare folks. We activated an emergency operations center. And then because of you, lab medicine, we started testing everybody who showed up in the ED that Monday. There is no place in the world that was able to do that work. Absolutely incredible, heroic effort to get this up and running uh, by you and your colleagues. I mean, again, I can't be grateful enough that we're able to do this. We put us in a much safer position compared to any other facility, probably in the planet, but definitely in North America, uh, as we're dealing with this rapid rollout. Um, so the EOC part, um, this kind of uh, trend, this is where everything changed in my life. Uh, so that was a Sunday, and you know, a lot of our people were like, I don't know, do we really need this? I'm like, we need an instant command, right? This is how we deal with mass casualty. You know, someone, remember the, the duck boat disaster? That was like 13 or 15 people. I'm like, we're dealing with a lot more people here. We're dealing with a hospital that's going underwater. We're dealing with a nursing home that is in flames, uh, metaphorically. 
Um, so we got that turned on. Um, just so you know what an emergency operations center looks like that uses the incident command structure that comes out of the uh, forest firefighting community, really the, uh, the wildland firefighting. And it works really well as a way to structure things. Um, there's an incident commander. There's people who, who sort of support the incident commander. And then there's different chunks. And there's lots more of these squares, but just to simplify it, there's operations, planning, logistics, finance. I'm missing one here, communications, which I'll talk about in a minute. Incredibly invaluable. And what I do is I run the medical technical group. And it's an important thing to recognize when you have this, the person's incident commander isn't the best pandemic doctor, right? It's not the best doctor. <laughs> it's the best person who can run a system, right? People who have expertise in running a disaster response. It doesn't need to be someone who knows how, what the best earthquake deal is or how to fight electrical fires or how to deal with uh, mass casualty events. It doesn't need to be a surgeon, for instance, or an infectious disease doctor. You really want someone who knows how to run a response and use these different specialty groups to get the work done. It took a while for us to figure out because we're so used to doing things on our own that it, there was a bit of time there where we were driving them nuts because we kept writing policies and doing the communications and doing all the operations until we finally got integrated. Um, but this is what I run, is this medical technical group, which is a group of nurses, docs, laboratory medicine folks, and other folks uh, across UW Medicine who uh, basically advise the whole EOC on what we should be doing. Um, this is how it started at Harborview. Uh, you can see a lot of unmasked faces. This is back in the early days. A lot of people crowded in here. This is our emergency operations center. Um, it's fascinating. Adrian, who just set this up, um, is someone I knew. Uh, we were working on Zoom to do some rural health training. And uh, we didn't know how to use Zoom. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. I brought him in because I'm like, there's this thing called Zoom. You guys, it'll be really good if we get out of this room eventually. Um, this is a Wall Street Journal. Folks came in, there's Vanessa out in the middle again. Supply chain, you know, at our side. Uh, Bob Harrington, Lisa Chu from leadership, trying to figure this all out. Nurses from all over. Um, just incredible transition. And this is really, because kind of been, became my life. Uh, not maybe physically in this room, but sort of uh, in the work that I do since then. Uh, when we think about not being prepared and think about where we are now to where we were then, uh, this is how we were tracking how many patients were in different hospitals. This is my writing. Sorry, my writing is terrible. I'm not expecting you to read this. In part, that's part of the point, uh, is that every day I'd be calling all the hospitals, figuring out where everyone was, who, who had COVID, who didn't. I figured out how many they had pending. So you can see Valley, Northwest, UWMC, Harborview, how many tests were getting done. So I was talking to uh, Jeff uh, all hours of the day, um, or Alex, or Keith, and uh, figuring that all out, figuring out like Airlift Northwest, what's going on there and then thinking about how much PP we had. We had to set up employee testing. As I mentioned, one of the first big issues, we had that big exposure. We had a patient uh, who died in our hospital with no precautions, uh, with NCOV, with a whole bunch of doctors, a whole bunch of nurses, a whole bunch of respiratory therapists who were exposed. And we figured out, you know, we need to set up testing. And so right across from our emergency operations center, we commandeered a conference room, put up this plastic barriers, and we would escort them. They would say, go find the sun in the back of Harborview, park there, Someone will come out and call us. We'll, care, we'll walk you through a back corridor, go in there, and we'll do the testing, right? And again, I'm so grateful that we were able to test people at this point, right? So we went from this terrible CDC test, all these barriers, to having like reasonably good access. I, we were joking about, I, yes, there was the pipette error, and there was reagent error, and all that challenges, but way better than a lot of other places. Um, the other thing, though, and again, you're not meant to read all this, it was we quickly realized in terms of our preparation is that we were not prepared. Um, we right, re quickly realized that this was going to accelerate in the way, and in terms of the numbers we're going to be dealing with, we didn't have enough PPE, right? We were in the middle of respiratory virus season. We had patients with influenza, some patients with COVID, other people with other respiratory viruses. How do we test those people? How do we get them uh, into precautions to keep everyone safe? Uh, in my facility at Harvey, we have lots of shared spaces. Like, how do we use a, a solo room in the best possible way? How do we use PPE in a way that maximizes its efficiency in our supply? Because we did not have enough to put everyone in single rooms and everyone in PPE. And a major driver of sort of that ability to deal with our supply was our testing. So we actually mapped out from the time someone comes like into the ED to the time someone sticks a swab up their nose um, to the time that swab gets to the lab, the swab gets processed and tested um, to the result goes in the computer or comes off the machine into the computer, gets to the frontline folks that we can actually then take the person out of precautions or put them in isolation. Every moment of that timeline 
we were burning N95s, gloves, gowns. So supplies we were running out of. And so we were trying to figure out how to link our testing pathway and efficiency and turnaround time to our supply chain, right? And we actually kind of called it, a, we called it a Makarowitz unit, right? It was like a unit in time. And we started like talking about this to people across the country. We're like, you got to think about your turnaround time because that's linked directly to your supply chain, your burn rate, right? Um, and it was uh, a bit crazy because we were burning through stuff pretty fast. And I think we're doing better here than many other parts of the country. Again, thanks to the testing available here. So you can see burn rate, supply chain, completely linked together. Um, we, you know, we started building protocols. This is uh, one of the first patients who need to get intubated uh, down in our ICU. And you can see, you know, this person, this anesthesiologist, was by themselves in this room doing intubation. That's not typically how we do intubation. So trying to figure out new pathways to do this. How do you do things that don't increase the risk for the patient, but also don't increase the risk for the healthcare worker? Very challenging. Um, you know, and what type of PEP, what type of hoods? As we went through this and started developing policies and it's, you know, really challenging work and spending, you know, huge numbers of hours writing this stuff up, we recognize that other, obviously the rest of the country and the rest of the world is going to be dealing with the same issues, right? We're seeing, starting to see problems in Italy, remember that, and other parts of the world. We decided to take all of our policies and put them on the internet for free, like just out. We put up a web page and I put it on Twitter and said, anybody wants them, take them, put your name on them, don't, don't, don't waste your time writing policies. Just take it because you have other things to do. Um, and this is actually one of the probably the best things we decided, and actually another uh, great uh, pat on the back for UW Medicine, because I said to our leaders, I'm like, we really need to just put this up public. And they're like, okay. And I got someone to do the, the website, and away we went. And this is, I still hear from people say, thank you for just making all your policies public, because it saved them time, right? Because this was an emergency. Um, Seth Cohen and Jenny Brackett, many others are in the Northwest, built the country's first drive up test site. Right? This is something we saw in, like, in Korea and China uh, that was being done. None of, did not exist in North America, but uh, they decided to make it happen, and they did. And this is in the garage of Northwest. Uh, incredible work by the team there, uh, really innovative. Uh, recently just closed last week, I think. Um, but it really incredible work that I think provided what needed to happen for uh, health care workers who needed to get tested as well as patients. How am I doing for time? I know we started a little bit off. 20 minutes or so? Okay, good. Um, and then things, again, took another, another shift. I remember this was a Wednesday night. Everyone's like, you know, kids are in school. We're kind of dealing, you know, it's an emergency, but we're dealing, dealing. And then Wednesday night, I forget it was the head of SPS or the mayor said, we're closing schools tomorrow. Right? It was a Thursday. And I was like, oh, no. I mean, because, again, how do I keep my job? How do I keep the doors open? I need the doors open. I need people to keep the doors open. I need nurses, respiratory therapists who have kids in those schools. What are those kids going to do? What are those people going to do with those kids? Huge issue. We also started seeing an impact on healthcare workers. So uh, I don't know if you guys remember this at all, but there were a couple of emergency room docs who got COVID. One ended up on ECMO. This freaked people out, understandably, completely understandably. Really scary. Uh, and at this point, we're starting to deal with some significant constraints in access to some of that high-level care like ECMO. We're getting to the point where we're getting close to running out of ECMO circuits in the Pacific Northwest. It got started getting very, very difficult. So we're starting to deal with like, how do we deal with healthcare workers? How do we deal with, you know, healthcare workers getting sick and that fear component? Um, and again, I want to give a lot of credit to our communications team uh, and to uh, Ann Browning and to Trish Critic, who uh, came up, I forget what month it was, came up with this idea of town hall. Hopefully everyone's dialed into at least once um, for the other people, not me. Um, and. Uh, I remember sitting down for that first one on a Friday, you know, just I've been working very hard, three o'clock, I'm like, I do not want to be here. Like, I got stuff to do. I do not want, this is a waste of time. I'll just be transparent. And I was absolutely wrong, right? One of the, my failings and one of the things I would do differently was to start that sooner. People need to hear what's going on. People need transparency. I'm a transparent person, I share everything, but I don't like do it, I, I just was, wasn't in front of mind. I was like, once we get this dealt with, we will then start talking about it. What we need to do is talk about it in, right away to everybody. The other thing I would uh, probably do is get more representatives from different healthcare areas into sort of like a council so that we could at least tell them what was going on. And they could, like, they could give their feedback, you know? When I said, you know, we can't use X and we put the message out there, we could talk about it in town hall, but I think it'd be good to hear it the other way so that people can say, okay, I get it. I'll tell my coworkers, this is why we're doing things, or you know, this is really stressing us out, the way you're doing things. And so I think that communication part is really, really important. 
Um, we also recognize that came out of this, and this is something that's kind of continued, the Washington Medical Coordinating Committee. So while we, this was going on in March, we were watching Evergreen go underwater, right? And if we lost Evergreen, we would lose a whole facility. And with the number of patients we were seeing, we couldn't afford that. We had no place, like where could we put people? And so we started working, it was actually pretty wild. We worked with Amazon and Microsoft and they're battling with each other about who can make the best platform to track COVID patients across the entire state. Uh, I think Microsoft eventually uh, was the chosen folks and it was in, in being sponsored by a group of folks. But Steve Mitchell and Mark Taylor at Harborview uh, run this and the first, I remember Steve turned to me and said, what should we call it? I'm like, Regional COVID Coordinating Center, RC3. And it stuck and it was great. Eventually the governor didn't like that and turned to the WMCC, but this is still going on. And it's something again, that doesn't exist in other parts of the country. Other, co other states are looking at this. We're good at triaging from a site like that, that, uh, that nursing home, but we're not good at triaging from hospitals. And what we recognize is that like Evergreen, because we weren't triaging appropriately to capacity in different hospitals, we were putting one hospital at very high risk for not being able to take any patients. Um, and getting overwhelmed. They may be turning to a place where transmission occurs. And so really the goal of this, and it's now been sustained, is how do we balance patients across the state? And this has now gone well beyond COVID into just balancing patient loads in all ways. Pretty wild. Then we entered into the quiet phase. There's a shot down 9th Avenue. I don't think I've ever seen 9th Avenue empty. Uh, there's a little heart out in the distance. It was pretty surreal. I think you all, maybe you don't want to remember, but probably this is something we all shared, you know. Pretty wild to be driving to work and no one else is on the road. Um, definitely weird. Um, we had lots of sort of rallying. This is Harborview with their socks called COVID socks. Again, pre-masks uh, to some extent. Uh, people trying to rally around this kind of a can-do attitude, which is great. And then we lost someone. Uh, we've lost two people at Harborview. Uh, I think in UW Medicine, uh, a couple in that first year. But uh, this is uh, Alex Volman. He was a burn peds ICU nurse. Uh, who got COVID at work. He got COVID from a patient and he died, which is awful, right? It was awful. Um, it was awful for everyone. Obviously awful for him and his family, awful for his unit, awful for the Harborview community. And, you know, uh, the decisions we made around PPE at that point led to his death, which sucks. Um, shifting gears a little bit to our kind of approach to all this, there's this thing called hierarchy of controls. Uh, we use an occupational response to occupational health where we look at what's the most bang for your buck, right? Where do you get the best benefit from uh, mitigation? Um, and people often go down to PPE. I want a mask, I want an N95, I want all this stuff. When in fact, that's the least effective. That means you can't avoid this, the, the uh, risk. You have to be by the risk. You have to be in front of someone with COVID or by someone with some other disease. And there's lots of other things we can put into place. You know, can we test people and get them out of the facility, send them home, right? Can we uh, do engineering controls, increase air, you know, air circulation or similar? Um, and we started to uh, start a work on this. Um, you guys remember, we did this at all three facilities, building an ER outside. We had the tents outside. Again, closed down 9th Avenue in front of Harborview. Again, mind blowing to think back about that and built outdoor spaces, increased ventilation, more space, right? Uh, be able to shunt people with symptoms out of the ERs so we wouldn't have to we wouldn't be increasing the risk to people indoors, either health workers or patients. We started building spaces uh, in, in blocks in our ER. And again, it's the same in all the different facilities. And then in April, that's me, uh, we turned on masking. This was so weird in retrospect, because I remember being like, do we really want to wear masks like all the time? Like everywhere in the hospital? Like, and I, and I kind of tested, I put it on, I walked in, I was like, this is so awkward. This is, I, felt, I had all this like internal like angst about wearing a mask like all the time. Uh, but I did it. We made this is one of the things that drove the EOC nuts. Santiago Neme and I, we wrote the policy, we pushed it out. I think it was like on a Thursday, everyone's gotta wear masks. Um, and that was a good decision. A little bit late, but it happened. Um, and it's really part of this, and hopefully I don't know if you guys have seen these sort of Swiss cheese models. They're common in aviation and other uh, high risk industries. This is by a guy named Ian McKay, who's a virologist out of Australia. And he, this is one from 2020 where we started like looking at how do we put you know, this into action in a way that people understand. Um, and it, he sort of split into personal responsibilities like mask, wear, wash your hands, stay home if you're sick, and shared responsibilities like ventilation and distancing and, and ways we can do things, providing sick call, and eventually in December, uh, vaccines. And we built these toolkits. Here's a COVID-19 prevention and control bundle. 
Uh, here's one for healthcare worker safety, and you know, involves lots of things uh, there, sort of trying to fit into that Swiss cheese mitigation model. Um, I'd also like to point out that we started realizing, remember I showed that little red thing over about healthcare, uh, sorry, low wage workers. Um, you know, low wage workers are disproportionately people of color in our country. Um, and we started seeing signals of, of inequity, inequitable infection rates and death rates uh, across King County. So just to give you an example, this is from the King County dashboard. Uh, the blue is percent of cases and gray is percent of King County population. So in King County, about 60% of people are white uh, and about 40% of cases, uh, they have about 40% of cases. But if you look down to some of the other uh, communities of color here, 6.4% of people in King County are black, yet they represent 12.5% of people with infections. Um, this is looking at Hispanic Latin X populations, 10% of the population, almost 30% of all the infections. Uh, and down here, uh, just under 1% of people in our county are native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, yet had 2.5% of all the infections. We knew this was gonna happen. This is the way infectious diseases perpetuate. They prey on poverty, they prey on equity, they prey on prejudice and, and other things, and COVID was no different. And this happened despite knowing that. And it still is happening uh, in, our, in our community and in our country, which uh, again, sucks. So chapter three vaccines, this is only two slides, just because of time, but also I wanna point out just some important things because I could spend, as I said to Josh, I could spend hours and hours talking about all this. Um, there's Tim Dell on the left, and that's Dr. Tuan Ong, who's a geriatrician. Dr. Ong went into more nursing homes before vaccines existed than almost anyone else. Besides the people who worked in those spaces, he spent 2020 racing into nursing homes over and over and over again, taking care of the highest risk people. You know, people's in their 70s, their 80s, their 90s, people with significant comorbidities, people with cognitive issues, people who had no one else to take care of them, in places where they had no control over the environment. They had no control over masking and hand hygiene, right? Uh, poorly staffed facilities. And he went in there over and over and over again at great personal risk, I would argue, given how much time he spent in those facilities, because he cared. And he was one of the first people to be vaccinated. And it weighed heavily on him. This is moments after his vaccination, it was the front of the Seattle Times. And he was just thinking, why do I get vaccinated while the people I care about, these older adults living in these places who have no control, don't get it? It was sort of a mixed thing. I was so grateful that vaccines were available to healthcare workers in December of 2020. It was incredible scientific achievement. But it was hard for a lot of people, especially as we entered into it, into a tiered approach, right? Uh, where a lot of people didn't have access, while well, some did. Even though you were the people at the bedside doing the care, it wasn't an easy uh, situation. The other thing we started dealing with then was misinformation and disinformation. I'll come back to this in a minute, but I had no clue, zero clue, that this was gonna become a political issue. I had no clue that misinformation and disinformation, active disinformation, was gonna be propagated and was gonna be exploited and was gonna be as big as it was. No clue. I did not know that this amazing scientific achievement was going to be you know, contradicted. Um, the one most important tool we had to eliminate COVID-19 from our population was going to be uh, denigrated. No, I was not prepared for that. So again, another area, maybe I should have been less naive. Chapter four variants, I'm not gonna spend again, tons of time on this super interesting uh, area. This is again a snapshot of weekly cases since January 2020 through November 2nd. Uh, you can see the blue is the number of cases and then uh, the yellow is the total cases per 100K. Um, and you can see total up to like 30,000 30, per 100K. And you know, as these variants have come and gone, they've all carried sort of different infection sort of rates with the most largest one being our first Omicron surge, right, BA1 in January of this year. This year's really been the Omicron era, but you can see Delta before that, you know, a big dip, and then Alpha even before that. And what's important to recognize is that as these waves have come and gone, you know, we can argue about infection rates and uh, pathogenic, you know, our pathogenicity and so forth, but they've all had serious impacts on people's health, right? Not only in the outpatient setting, but this is looking at uh, prevalent hospitalizations. So how many people are in a hospital because of COVID every day? You can see, you know, alpha, delta, and the first wave of Omicron, pretty big hospitalization rates, very high, huge impacts on our emergency departments, our clinics, and our hospitals. Um, and this continues to go on, right? Uh, this is a map from uh, NextStrain, I think developed by Trevor Bedford and others, looking at sort of the 
uh, diversity of different strains that did come up. And you know, the ones that we were super worried about, like Delta, more pathogenic, more infectious, get replaced with Omicron. Some of those Omicron lineages died out and then they you know, get replaced by others. And now we're about to move into the BQ era, right? Uh, so we're leaving, so we had BA1, BA5 all summer, and then just in the last two weeks, BA5 is now the minority and being replaced by a whole host of different variants, fortunately none of which are associated with increased pathogenicity, um, but definitely more transmissibility. So we're gonna have to see how that plays out in our area and lots, a whole stew of these variants emerging now. And you can sort of see how this looks. So here's BA5 in green, and then you can see BA4.6, BQ1, BF7, BQ1.1, and so forth. It's a whole stew of variants that we're heading into as we move into this uh, winter season when we've also been told the pandemic is over, right? Um, so all these non-pharmaceutical interventions that we built up over the last few years around masking, distancing, access to testing, right? Staying home, sick pay, uh, maybe just starting to deal with some of those inequities in our communities. Um, you know, people are saying goodbye. They're done. They're moving on. Um, and I think this is my colleague, Sling Gounder, who's a friend of mine, wrote this on Twitter. And I thought it was good. She said, people are conflating a pandemic which describes how an infectious pathogen spreads to the human population to cause disease and death. And the human response to a pandemic which includes the spectrum of everything, right? You know, China's zero COVID policy lockdown to doing nothing. And I think people have conflated this. They, they, don't, they don't think about the pandemic as a biological phenomenon. They're thinking about what do we do about it? It's, the, it's like the social context in which this happens. And I understand that, it makes sense. But we need to separate those things out because we have to be prepared for this ongoing pandemic. I have to be prepared in it for it as I keep our doors open. How do I keep my health workers safe? How do I keep patients getting care that they need in a situation that is now worse than it's ever been for hospitals, right? Um, and the fact is that the human response, people are just tired. They wanna move on. They wanna get back to normality. Um, so this is that Swiss cheese model I showed you. We have learned lots of things. Here's the most recent one that Ian put out just, I think, in the middle of October. There's a lot of things going on there, but I think one of the important things I keep coming back to that he's added, empathic, actual, and culturally responsive communication. We should have been doing that day one. We should have been talking to leaders in communities that we know are gonna be disproportionately impacted. We should be talking to you know, religious leaders in the Muslim community. We should be talking to leaders of black churches. We should have been talking to leaders in uh, the Hispanic community. We should have been talking to all those people on day one and getting them involved in how do we respond. We should have been talking to our healthcare workers and our colleagues and our rest of our community very early. And we should have been using science. We talked a lot about what we should do. We should be wearing masks. We should get vaccinated. But we didn't talk to people about science. Why do we do these things? And the fact is, and I had, I had the privilege of having breakfast with Tony Fauci about three or four weeks ago, and when asked what he would change, what he would have done differently, is explain to people what science is. Science is fallible, it makes mistakes. We evolve, we change. That's why our message changes. We don't just change because, you know, you guys know all this. I don't have to explain to you. We don't change because we just feel like it, or we want to be mean. We change because the data changes, the, our experience changes, what we learn changes, and our message as a result changes. But we don't talk about why we decide to make changes. And we should have set that up very, very early on. And then lastly, that misinformation mouse that's chewing away at all these things all along. We should have been more prepared for. Just as I get to closing here, I, I do want to emphasize that we have some opportunities in some because of some huge gaps. That Those inequities that played out in our own county in terms of morbidity and mortality in communities are currently playing out across the planet, right? This is a map from the New York Times vaccine tracker looking at the share of population received at least one dose of vaccine. The brown colors, the light tan colors, are you know, less than 50%. The greenish colors to the right are more than 50%. That's one shot. That is a problem. That is, this is a disaster. This should not have happened. We have enough vaccine to get a shot into everybody's arm everywhere in the world. This is a failure of global leadership, right? And then we look at what's gonna make the difference, those additional vaccines, the boosters, it's even worse. It's worse everywhere, but particularly worse in the same areas where we haven't gotten a single shot into someone's arm, right? This is something that uh, Peter Hotez, who's a vaccine researcher in Texas, uh, very vocal uh, in social media, but also obviously a very successful scientist, uh, put it out in a, a commentary in Nature Reviews Microbiologist a couple of days ago. This is, you know, we have a chance to deal with this, to, to respond to that gross inequity. Um, and, you know, this is our chance. We have these, these new boosters, 
we should be getting them out to folks uh, as a global uh, community going forward. Um, and recognizing that um, you know, people are getting sick and people continue to die everywhere. Our current counts now are about officially around 7 million. We know that's probably 50%. We probably lost 15 million people due to this pandemic. Um, and it's just remarkable to think three years ago, a little bit under three years ago, we had 555 people when I got on board with this response in the world with like 17 people dead. So to go from like 17 people dead, we had two here, you know, the first one or two in North America here in Seattle, to 15 million dead people in less than three years, is the fact that I'm even talking about this, uh, I don't think is set in, to be honest. Um, and the future is, just to close out things, uh, going back to the 30,000 foot view, is that, as Josh mentioned, this is not our last go around. I've dealt over the course of my career with, um, let's go forward here, Ebola, um, you know, MERS rollouts, uh, Zika, obviously SARS-CoV-2, TB, measles, incredibly drug resistant uh, bacteria, C. Oris is in, is in uh, Portland now, highly drug resistant fungal infection that adheres to environments is virtually impossible to get rid of. Um, and we got an Ebola outbreak going on right now that we're preparing to deal with because it's got into Kinshasa, which is the major metropolitan area, and it's in the hospitals there. Unfortunately, this is a, uh, an Ebola Sudan variant that doesn't have great vaccines to. Merck has one. I haven't heard of they deployed it yet, but they don't have treatment for. Why do we not have treatment for a disease that we know is going to happen? when we have vaccines and treatment for Ebola, Zaire, another variant. Again, a gap in our uh, response. And I think just underneath all this is we're gonna be dealing with lots of challenges around inequities. So poverty, racism, inequality. Climate change is gonna be a huge issue for us uh, as we deal with all these pathogens coming into our facilities, banging at our front doors uh, in our communities. Zoonoses, where all these things come from, Zika, SARS-1, SARS-2, Ebola are all zoonotic infections, right? And as we Climate change, we're going to see changes in all of these different pathogens as a result, um, including airborne pathogens. And we're seeing that play out in different parts of the world. Um, so with that, hopefully I didn't take too much of your time, but I want to say thank you to my family who has uh, suffered a lot over the last three years, but have been incredibly supportive. My colleague, Chloe Bryson Khan, is an ID doc and Nessa, my partners in crime at Harborview. The incredible teams uh, in employee health, infection prevention across all of our entities um, the UW Medicine Emergency Operations Center team, planning, comms, operational logistics, the clinical leadership, public health, South King County, who've been incredible partners, and so many others. I mean, it's an infinite, this list. Uh, I'm hopefully I'm not excluding anyone really important. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. And I think I'm supposed to be evaluated. There you go. Feel free. Be brutal. It doesn't really bother me anymore. Yeah, Andrew. You talk about a lot about the failures, the public health infrastructure and support, and you know we saw recurrent events with monkeypox, et cetera. Um, but th those are some societal structural issues, funding. What at the institutional level do you think we can do better to prepare for the next one? Yeah, so I think what we have to recognize is that we have a public health role. We have a significant public health role, and we need to prepare to do that work. So we need to advocate actually very strongly for our public health colleagues. We need funding. I am hoping, uh, you know, within the next couple of weeks, once the midterms are sort of behind us, I think, again, talking to government relations folks, that uh, Congress will be a little bit more open to maybe supporting public health. My understanding is they have zero interest in supporting anything pandemic related. Um, but if we can get them on board with like simply public health funding at the federal level, which then percolates down to the state and, and local health jurisdictions, we should be doing that. We should be active about it. But I think as a healthcare system that's our size, at Utah Medicine and other healthcare facilities and other systems need to have a public health response prepared. They need to be able to step in and do that work. And I'll just give you concrete examples. The things, some of the things that Utah Medicine did really well, we got vaccine vans, right? We had testing vans. They drove down to communities that had the highest incidence in South King County and did amazing work providing access, right? Historically, we would have thought that's a public health role. They could not do it. And so Utah Medicine stepped up and did it. Some of it was grant funded, some of it was R funded, right? Different ways of doing it. But we need to prepare to do that work um, going forward. So John, it's nice to hear you talk for more than five minutes. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. That's a plus minus. Yeah, the thing that's actually really um, been one of the most frustrating things for me is actually the demonization of public health, the public health system in general. Yeah. And they're the bad guys, dude. Beyond just the 
all the misinformation about vaccines, but you know, people in public health who are actually threatened, who've quit. Um, I mean, I don't really have a question here, but that, that, that to me is really one of the most distressing no. things because the public health system was established, what, like back in the early 1900s, essentially, um, to help try to keep people healthy. And the fact that it's been demonized is just... Yeah, I mean, it's been horrific. I mean, anybody who has a colleague in public health knows the turnover in those facilities has been huge. I would say that it's also, to some extent, from a political perspective, I learned a lot about politics over the last few years, is the way that it's like, it's, it's, it's like government, right? It's like, it's, it splits down to the lowest local level. So it's incredible to have public health Salican County, one of the best public health departments in the country, but it's just one small health department. And it, so its ability to have a voice at a larger level is, it's not, it, I mean, the whole country's sort of, you know, split into these tiny little, uh, fiefdoms of public health, and that takes away their, their voice, I think, to a large extent. So there's real pros to having that set up, but I think it really incapacitates the ability to get concrete funding uh, at the national level. And it's been horrific. I think you had, Dr. Yeah, Schertz? Uh, um, I, I was going to ask Dan's question, which is how, how do we talk science in a way that, that helps people understand the, the you know, tra translate kind of what, what science is to what the health, Cape County you know, public health that does, mm -hmm. and so that people uh, listen to it and resonate with it. Yeah, I mean, I think so. We're lucky in our area. We have great relationships with the local media. And I think that what maybe we should do, if we have to do this again, I would even, you know, bring the idea of let's set up regular, like, you know, what was it? Was it FDR doing fireside chats? You know, it's like, we should have science fireside chats. Hey, this is what's coming. Every Wednesday at seven, we're gonna have a rotating group of folks. We're gonna, and we'll just start small. We're gonna talk about, you know, here's what we know, here's what we don't know. Here's what we're gonna try to figure out in the next week. And next week, I'll give you an update. Have we made any progress, have we not? Here's how this could change things. Maybe it's gonna tell us that these masks aren't good enough. I think talking about what's where, you know, early about why we do things in a concentrated way. And our media here locally, our health reporters are really good. And I think they'd be on board with, if we were able to step out and commit to that, we would do it. Some of the most powerful uh, comms we're doing right now, I'm, I'm terrible, I'm spacing on the person's name, but there's a group that does community conversations on Fridays, like 12 or one o'clock. And it's just open to these different communities, um, often communities that are impacted disproportionately. And they send in questions, and she just gets a bunch of different people who can talk about it, and they just talk about the answers. Town hall, why don't we have, like, why doesn't everyone have access to a town hall where they can send in questions and you can answer them? And you start saying, you can frame those questions, you know, here's, well, here's why we know that, and here's why we don't. We might not never know that answer, but here's what we're gonna do to keep people safe. You know, we're gonna do the best we can. I think would all be ways we would do it. And we were just so crushed with the overwhelming, like, person level response that we, many of us in the trenches weren't thinking about what, sh what we should have been thinking about. So thank you very much. I, I had a question which could apply to sort of public health systems, but I'll ask it about sort of the institutional response. You know, I'm struck at your, your home response team. You all had day jobs, if you will. So how do you balance preparing for rare but catastrophic events, and I'm channeling you, how do you balance preparing for rare but like, catastrophic events with sort of maintaining the day-to-day -day work? Yeah. And particularly when the funding required to be able to respond to those challenges is not a, sort of an evenly distributed. Yeah. Region. It's almost the same thing as we deal with in the hospital. Like I have four infection preventionists. You know, I have a team of folks who deal with, you know, all the routine surveillance and stuff like that. But they, we also have outbreaks. Hey, we have an outbreak. Of, See if we have an outbreak of norovirus and we have to like stop everything and go and respond, right? And we, to some extent, build our re redundancy into our system. And I think it's incumbent on systems, again, our size. If you're a good sized hospital, you're part of a larger system. I think having a pandemic response plan and who's gonna be doing that work is, I think that's normal business operations. I mean, again, I've been doing this work for 12 years I've dealt with numerous types of influenza. I've influenza outbreaks in the hospital. I've had measles walk through the front door, Ebola twice, um, Zika. And you know, all of these take a lot of time to respond to, obviously nothing like this, but it takes a lot of time, a lot of resources. 
But that's the reality. And I think we have to be clear when we put together our SBARs, you know, situation, background, assessment, recommendations, that this is the cost of doing business. You know, as the climate changes, as we see these inequities roll out in these different communities, uh, particularly for infectious diseases, part of our business plan needs to be able to respond to those things. It's just the cost of doing business um, at this point, whether it's in healthcare or, or any place else. That'd be my argument. Because everything I do stops. You know? I stopped doing infection control three years ago. You know? And you see this in, in, I mean, I show you graphics. You look at our CLABSI rate across the country, that's our central line associated with blood sugar infection, more COVID patients, more CLABSIs. When we were, we, the environmental services couldn't go in those rooms early on in 2020 uh, to clean the rooms, right? And we're like, nurses can clean it. No, they can't. Nurses don't know how to do that, right? And we had more infections occur in those spaces, right? Um, we have to be realistic about what we can do and, and we have to prepare for it. Uh, that was great. I had a couple of questions. Um, so the first was, uh, you kind of mentioned briefly the failure to uh, adequately or equitably distribute the vaccines around the world and particularly the failing in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, is what is, what do you see as the role of uh, major medical organizations such as the UW Medical Conglomerate um, in working with international organizations like the WHO for more effective distribution and enforcement around the world. Um, and then I can ask my second question now. Or yeah, go for it. No? Okay. And my second question uh, was, uh, I think your town hall kind of fireside chat idea is a fantastic one. Uh, how do you think we might be able to, as a scientific community, might be able to go about uh, making some of that information sharing a little more uh, clad against the warpings of the mainstream yeah. media. Gosh, those are great questions. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to necessarily, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your second question. I'm going to try. I think everybody in this room should do media training. I am a strong proponent of media training. Um, and we should be taking the opportunity as healthcare workers, as scientists, to be speaking to the media about the work that we do, about uh, you know, interest in the, in the community. I think we should be taking opportunities, I'm not talking like every week, but you know, once in a while, volunteer in a high school, in a college, or in a retirement center, or you know, uh, a church or something, and talk about what you do or what UW does. I think that we need to be doing that, and I think we have to be able as people who do science, who can explain science, know how to communicate science. Science communication, I think, is a critical skill, and we suck at it. I'm sorry, I've used that word suck like three times, but we suck at it, it's four times now. Um, and um, we, but there's ways to do it. There's actually ways to talk to journalists that are effective, that get what you need to get across, um, and we should all have that in our toolkit. Um, and so I think that we need to build, we build that capacity in everyone, who does who, who can speak about science needs to understand how to talk about science and I think it's to be a discrete uh, educational initiative in UW uh, in terms of I think that um, at our role and I'm not sure if I answered your total second question but um, the kind of connecting it actually kind of connects to the first question and I'm not an expert on the global distribution of vaccines to be clear um, but you know this takes country level action right it, it takes action from the White House, and it, like we did, we've done this. One of the what's the most successful public health program the United States has ever been involved in? PEPFAR. We have saved millions and millions of lives. Uh, now I, I won't make political comments, but it's the um, it, it has been extremely effective, um, and we could have used the same template, public-private partnerships, to drive distribution. Right? We take. X amount of money from the Fed, maybe partner with a few other folks, and we've done this. We do this like to some extent with malaria, right? And we do this with other infected TB, right? Public-private partnerships. We dump a, for our budget, tiny, for a vaccine, pretty big, and because Merck is not going to do it, they're just not. They, they have to pay their people, right? They have a fiduciary responsibility to make money. That's their job. Making vaccines is how they make money, right? But they, their job is to make money, and so we got to find a way to partner with them buy huge supplies and figure out how to distribute it in countries that want to partner. 
And again, use the PEPFAR model, right? We, we have, here at UW, we have people know how to educate, right? We know how to distribute. We just need to uh, partner with folks uh, in those places to get the vaccines out. I mean, you can go to parts, I mean, I've, I work in Kenya, and I, I, you can go to some parts of Nairobi, everyone's got their vaccines, right? You can get them if you're the right person, right? And so we, th we know we can get the drugs there. Uh, we just gotta get enough and get it distributed out to people. And I think, with, I think we, we're fully capable. Sorry, I'm not sure if that answers your question either. No, that's great. Thank you guys.